my friends, I am so excited to share this episode with you because I have a very special friend of mine as a guest today, Julie Evans. Now, Julie is an animal communicator, and I will let Julie share her story, but she has not always been an animal communicator, and she has many different modalities that she brings in when she communicates with animals, and she is magical. Julie, thank you for being here. I am so excited to talk to you. So the story is you and I met about a year-ish ago, um, and we were in a course. And in that course, uh, we came to know of one another and to know each other. And since then, I have had the pleasure of not only recommending your services, but also purchasing your services for others, and also experiencing your magnificent gift and service in my own life um, as an animal communicator. So let's start with, Julie, what the hell is an animal communicator? I know, right? <laughs> so the animals, um, I hear them in English, German, and Spanish. I'm discovering that they send me the messages and the images, how I'm able to receive them. So it's not necessarily their first language. Um, I'm an empath. I've always been an empath. So I feel what the animal feels. And then the animal and I talk. Like one of the things is when they howl and they're trying to reach their person, their pack mate, um, I tell them they're, the person's hearing is broken. And then they're like, oh, and then they stop howling so loud um, when they, they don't realize how our capacities as human are different and not as intense and not as sensitive as the animal's capacities, smell, hearing, sight, all of that. Um, so I don't know what an animal communicator is, but I know what I do. And as Tanya said, there were numerous events in my life and, and um, capacities and skills that I developed over time that led me to be, have these capacities with animals. Now I know your story and it's a huge, what the fuck it is. It's a huge, what the fuck, please, Julie share with our listeners, how on earth you started to hear animals. Okay. So as a child, I had the intuitiveness and the empathicness with the animals. Okay. And I would rather be with an animal than with people. So I would verbally, like many of us do, we ask a question out loud and then we kind of get a sense of what the animal wants. And do they want food? Do they want to go out? Do they want, you know, and, and many of us have this, but I wasn't hearing them in English in, in my head. And I wasn't able to communicate with animals that weren't right in front of me. Um, I didn't have the telepathic aspect of it. So about four years ago, I was hit by a truck. Okay. But, but <laughs> let's, let's, just, let's just stop there for a second because I know that our listeners are like, what the fuck? This woman got <laughs> hit by a truck. Okay. So let's just let that sink in for a second. Four years ago, my friend Julie was hit by a truck. Oh my God. Were you hurt? Oh yeah. Felt like my head was part of the pavement. Like one of those pieces of artwork where that are in stone or ceramic and that are on the wall where half mm -hmm. the head's coming out of the wall. Like that piece of artwork, that's what my head felt like. It felt like half of my head was part of the pavement now. Um, yeah. So I was a pedestrian. I wasn't in a car. I was a pedestrian hit by a Chevy Silverado here in America. Um, so it wasn't, I didn't just fall down, which is hard enough if you fall down and you hit your head, that's hard enough. So I was like at how many miles per hour forced into the pavement. Yeah. What, ha what happened as a result of the accident? Well, um, 
Okay, so I had been an accountant. My mother had been an accountant um, in Canada. It's called Chartered Accountant. In the United States, it's called Certified Public Accountant CPA. So that's what I had done. And I had taught it also at the universities. So my whole life had been spreadsheets, databases, reading. It's, it, it was all reading. And I'm a bit of an introvert, so I, I love reading. I could not read. I would get a tremendous headache. It would take me three hours to read one paragraph. I'd keep reading the paragraph over and over again, trying to get, I was trying to get back to what had soothed me. My refuges that I had had were gone. Um, In an instant. Right, right. And these massive headaches would come on. So um, there was, there's a head trauma there. There are neural pathways that are broken, kind of, kind of like um, either an earthquake has happened. Um, for those in California, when the earthquakes happen, now you can't get from point A to B anymore. You can still get there, but you're, it's going to take you four to five hours longer because you take other roads. So that's what my brain was doing, um, mm-hmm. and it would get yeah, very tired. So I was like, okay, it took a somewhere within a year for that to be drilled down to because it was like there were other things there was a tooth that was damaged and that the the nerves were just on fire they were like are you having sinus issues are you having you know they go through the whole list is it just the stress and finally gets down to nope it's in the brain and it affected your vision okay I says, yeah, that's why I spend most of my day with my eyes closed. And I was listening to audiobooks. Because like I said, I've been an intellectual, so I still wanted to learn. So I was Beautiful. learning energy work. I was listening to all these audiobooks about energy work. And even one of them was called Talk to the Animals. So I started, <gasps> I started playing with it you know, with friends, animals that were, you know, they live an hour away or whatever. Let's see, you know, and, um, and then they started, I started hearing them clearly and we just started playing and my own dog started to talk to me. What I'm doing now, when I'm looking down people, if this ends up um, in a visual form Mm -hmm. is what calms my brain is I doodle or color. So that's what I'm doing while I'm talking to you to keep because my brain is kind of like an AFib heart where it goes boop, 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 boop. So I try, I have these little tools that I've learned to keep it, like keep it on track. <laughs> to stay grounded. Yeah. To so stay like grounded. A, mm-hmm. To stay grounded. So, so you started, okay. So, so you started learning these, these modalities. And, and as you were learning these modalities, you started to realize that you were able to communicate with dogs specifically. Now, one of those dogs was your own dog. And I know that, that his name is Chico. Tell me a little bit about Chico. Share, share with our audience how, what's so special about Chico? Well, Chico had been, I got him after the accident. I had another dog that was with me in the accident and he was older and then he passed. Um, So 11 months within the year after um, I got Chico. Now, Chico had been at the shelter a long time. Chico was reportedly 15 years old. That's one, five, 15. uh, they were like, are you sure you want to see him? You know, he had a... Most, yeah, most people when they're looking for a pet are keeping in mind, you know, companionship, commitment, relationship, but also the age of that dog and what comes with the age of that dog. So he was 15 and you still wanted to see him. Yes. And even though they got out his file and um, it was at uh, the Humane Society, which we have in Wisconsin and in the United States. So there's a number of branches and they have a good system in place. So they have a file on each dog. And, you know, his they told me to have his nails trimmed. It was medical, like his nail trimming was medical. I'm like, OK, is he like a diabetic, um, like a human needs to be careful with their feet when they're diabetic? Right. No, 
but now I learned that was like, oh, because he's got a, mm -hmm, okay, he might have to be tranquilized to have his nails trimmed, right? But I didn't know what it meant. So I was like, oh, yeah, we'll just, you know, keep him. Yes, I want to see him. And um, I saw him. He kind of ignored me. He just was like outside smelling stuff. He had been at the shelter such a long time um, that they were like, you know, $25. You know, it's, it's one of those dogs like, we'll, we'll pay you to take him mm -hmm. kind of a thing, you know. And so, yep. We left and um, uh, I left with him. I thought he was trying to commit suicide. He had like three of his really long legs out the window when we were going down the interstate. Uh, <laughs> it was just like, I don't think he'd ever been in a car. It turned out that he had been marginalized. He was quick to nip. Um, and so he was put outside. So he lived his life a major part of his life outside. He had bronchial damage when I took him to the vet and they x-rayed his chest. He had bronchial damage from getting pneumonia so deep being outside. And um, those of you listening in Canada, you know how it gets to part of the year. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the people would forget to give him water. They'd come home from work and forget to feed the dog outside. So he was not only alone, he was not well cared for. So I called him like a junkyard dog. In summer, mm -hmm. he'd crawl underneath like a rusty trailer if he'd see it. And I'd have to crawl underneath it and get him back. I'm like, no, you can come in the house with me. We have air conditioning. You don't need to, you don't need a trailer. You don't need a, because he, he had lived that way for such a long time and he just wouldn't die. So it's my belief that the people finally took him to the shelter. <laughs> You know, they're like, <laughs> and he still lived with me for two more years. So I practiced these modalities on his body. He had arthritis. He had, so, you know, he had um, cataracts. Um, and I, you know, once I found that his heart chakra had closed and that he had been marginalized, then I'd pick him up and I put him on the couch next to me so I could reach out and touch him if I wanted, like, you know, and also put certain crystals on his bed, which he left on his bed, ruby and zoitis, um, lavender quartz, blue lapis. He slept mm. with right underneath his chest. He'd sleep with his head between the zoitis and ruby and quartz, and then the lapis under his chest. So it was like pulling, part of it was he was used to being outside. So he was like, there's nothing like a good rock, you know? <laughs> So, and, but the other part was like, it was healing his body. Yeah. Um, so he would talk to me and he was rough around the edges. So he would use the F word a lot. He'd be like, ah, tell him fuck off. Um, <laughs> it'd be like, Arr. but he also would make sure nobody was um, unacknowledged. So everybody that was on the sidewalk or everybody that we met, he would acknowledge, he'd bark and go up and acknowledge them. No one is unacknowledged on my watch, which still makes me like, you know, because he had had this experience of being marginalized. And um, he, act, yeah, he actually didn't realize that a human could see him as he was. Oops. Um, I forgot to turn that on silent. Sorry. There we go. Oh, silent. No, okay. So I, I, this is interesting, right? So what you learned in communication with him was that it was important for him that no one was ever left unacknowledged because he had spent his time in isolation, kind of like the junkyard dog, like you said. Um, now his acknowledgement deepened because he became a part of your healing as well and your ability to communicate further with other animals and people. How did that happen? Um, yeah, I mean, right. It, it happened organically because COVID happened. So the, the things I was studying in the audiobooks and the energy work on humans was no longer feasible because no one was going to come to my home and, and get hop on my little massage table 
and let me, you know, do their energy work because especially when COVID just began, it was like, stay in your own pod and all that. So um, I had been doing animal communication for friends and family because they, they knew it and they would call them, even if they lost their cell phone in their apartment or their house, they say, I just, I haven't been able to find it for four hours. So I'd ask their cat where it was and their cat would tell me it's under, you know, it's under the bed, bed. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then they would go to the bed and they would find it. Now to some people, Julie, this sounds wacky. Okay? Oh yeah. I'm just going to be really straight up. I, this sounds wacky now. Um, I, I, you know, when we think about, sorry, I'm like, it does, it sounds so wacky. And yet I know it to be the truth. And I know with the gifts that you have. So with this animal communication, what kinds of changes were you able to start seeing or experiencing or understanding for your friends and their dogs? Okay. So one of the things I studied for humans was trauma clearing. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm able to do that with the animals now. So they're not so triggered. They have an amygdala just like we do, or the mammals, I should say. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, mm -hmm. um, and the animals actually receive it um, more easily than the humans because the animals aren't asking why or who was that who stabbed me in the back you know I, no they don't care they're like okay so I just had um ran into a former client right and they put down one dog called Aini her name is Aini so she was and um the other dog Leo is left behind as an only dog mm. So they're like, Leo is going into, this was two weeks ago and I found out about it last night. So the first thing I do is I do, it's called an exit stage left. And it's normally done like, you know, with humans, it's, it's a process that's run with the body and the spirit. It's get the fuck back in your body and make it work or choose to get out of your body. So a lot of times at life end or, you know, okay. So, however, I use it with animals that have been put down or that have been, um, you, you know, roadkill that have been hit or traumatic um, deaths mm -hmm. because they don't always leave their body fully, especially if something it happens like that. Right. Yeah. So we do an exit stage left, make sure they've separated from their body. Um, and then she was like, Leah, I said, where are you? She says in the house, in her, in her original house. And then she's like, Leo, the other dog, Leo, Leo, I'm here. I'm here. I'm, I don't have a body anymore. And Leo's like, oh, that explains it. <laughs> and he was, he was going from room to room looking for her because often when we put down an animal, we put them in the car, we take them to the vet and the animals that are left at the house are like, I don't know, our car rides bad. What, what just happened here? Right. Right. And they're looking for their pack mate. They're looking for their, if it's a cat, the colony, you know? And so the animal that the spirit that's left the body is kind of left to go and try to reconnect with their pack mates and be like, I'm still here. This is, you know, I just don't have a body anymore. Right. So then Leo's like, <sighs> like I, as I was texting the, the humans, the adults, you know, I was like, I have, I'm smiling as I'm texting you. So there's a quiet happiness now between Leo and Aini. Whereas for two weeks, he's been looking for Aini, which in my human heart just wants to start crying. Um, Cause he was the protector. He was the lead. He made sure Aini was always safe. Um, it was his role to take care of this particular other dog. So that's one. And, and so, okay, and this is, this is really incredible, Julie, because as you share this, I know in my own experience, the impact that you've had. So um, first of all, I, I, I want to share the, the story of my goddaughter. Um, 
my goddaughter and her husband have a dog who they were really struggling with. He was destroying everything. He was so distraught or dysregulated in his crate that he would destroy anything and even reach through the crate to get other things to destroy outside of the crate. Um, and so you worked with them to do a trauma clearing. And what did, did you remember what you learned in that? I don't. But they're all recorded and they're sent to the, the owner. That's why they're recorded. Right. right. And, and, I, and I guess the thing about that is too, is that you don't stay attached to that stuff, but the owners, it makes a huge difference. So um, some of the things that I know happened for them was they realized part of it was their own anxiety impacting their pet, right? Mm -hmm. Another thing that, um, that you did was you were able to communicate across the country, across actually the continent um, with their dog to help him understand that what he was doing was not the best choice and, that, and to give him context to it. Now, and the reason I say that is because we have um, now Walter and Maggie, and we were quite concerned about some of Maggie's trauma. So where you helped Noodle, my goddaughter's dog, and some of that chewing and that incessant obsessive stuff that was happening in the crate, which by the way, now he still just gently nibbles on the corner of a blanket, but that's it. Like the destruction ended. And it's incredible because it was a huge struggle for them. And, and so now, you know, we had a session with you and had you do some trauma clearing for Maggie. Do you want to share some of what that, what, what you learned about Maggie and that? I don't remember. Cause it's almost like channel. Like we have this conversation. I recorded on zoom. So mm -hmm. we have it, mm -hmm. but I don't remember a lot of details of it because it's gone. A lot of it's, it's gone. We cut the cords, we clear the trauma and it, with the animals, it's great. It's gone. They're not like, oh, let's analyze this. Let's write a book about this. They're, like, they're just like, oh, I feel better now. Thank you. Bye now. That is how, that's how they go. And I'm like, oh, okay. I don't remember. Oh, she was alone. She was alone a lot. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't remember the details about her trauma. Mm -hmm. uh -uh. So, so it's interesting because I love that because I, of course, remember because she's our Maggie and I was so concerned. And some of the big concerns that I had were around her feeling settled and comfortable and belonging and not caring so much of the trauma from, and she did, she said the circumstances of her previous life with her previous humans um, was a situation where she did spend a lot of time alone. And, and she is a dog that needs a pack. And so having the pack of our family and having the leadership of Wally has been actually very, very powerful. Um, it's been interesting, but we've had some challenges with her around chewing, destroying things. Um, and particularly, uh, she has taught Walter the art of chewing electrical cords. Now we've been super fortunate that it has, has been kind of exclusive to things that are not plugged in, but of course we continue, like that's something that's a real fear for us. And um, so you, you previously did some work on that and, um, and discovered that Wally is the one who now is actually so into the electrical cords and maybe not Maggie. Um, and she's and, like, She's like, Wally did it. When I check in with her, I'm like, what happened here? She's like, Wally did it. Wally did it. Like a sibling. <laughs> and you know what? What is so funny is the other day I sent you a text message with evidence of what had happened while Peter and I were gone to the gym. We always think because we leave at five o'clock in the morning that they'll just continue to sleep, but they clearly do not. And <clears throat> God. And so then these little creatures, we came home and they had done some destruction and some pictures and there was slobber all over things and plant was broken and all of these things. And 
I checked in with you and said, oh, it was a busy morning. And you said immediately, like Maggie was like, Wally did it. And sure enough, evidence uh, that it was Wally all over his face. Maggie, like no evidence, no evidence of Maggie getting into things at all, right? Mm -hmm. um, but as a pet owner, you know, I, you definitely are not someone who's going to all of a sudden make everyone's pet a super spectacularly obedient animal what you do do though is help them understand some of the stuff that they're doing isn't maybe right so for example one of the things that you communicated to wally was that he needs to stop touching our crap that's our right stuff. now i'm remembering yes he's like oh i just thought it was crap i didn't know it was important i'm like yeah it's important to them important it's like important bones <laughs> like a he's like oh they got a lot of crap it's like yeah it's but it's their bones <laughs> so we continue so we continue on the path of help of trying to help wally and maggie understand what crap is ours and what crap is theirs um and and um and you know like really truly some of it is is um some of it is it's frustrating right like as a as a as a as a pet owner or as the human of these pets it can be so frustrating for some people um and we've already seen an improvement although the other day when we found somebody was chewing on a pillow um i yeah i was like oh come on you guys come on you guys right um but it's improving. It really, truly is improving. What do you say to pet owners who are like, okay, can you just fix my dog? I'll say, um, let's see what shifts. So, you know, I explain, I'm the bridge between the human world and the dog world, the animal world. And once they realize what's for the benefit of the pack, if it's a dog, they generally choose to change their own behavior. I'm not a trainer, I'm not a vet. This is just all conversation with the dog and then the dog makes the choice. Julie, would you be open to checking in with Maggie and Wally right now, just so that our readers can, or our readers, our listeners can understand how this works? Seeing that. I said, Maggie, what's going on? She said, I don't know what's going on. Wally, what's going on? I'm chewing on something. Okay, Wally, is it your crap or, or the human's crap? Oh, shit. It's the fucking human's crap. <laughs> Wally, I need you to put it down, please. Okay, fine. Uh, where's my other orange thing? Where's my thing? Where's my thing? Maggie, where the hell's my thing? I gotta chew. I gotta find my thing now. Where's my thing? Thank you, Wally. Thank you for putting it down. Yeah. Oh, it's so frustrating. I don't know. Oh, so frustrating. I keep forgetting that it's their crap, not my crap, because it's like normally everything that I can touch is my crap. Oh, well, yeah, that's true. When you're outside, or you know, if you were a coyote, that would be true. Yeah, but because you live in a house with the humans, yeah, it's not true. Yeah, oh, it's hard. Can you tell the people that it's really hard? Because I'm not a human, but they expect me to live kind of like I'm a human and now I can't find my orange thing. Oh, okay, Wally, well, okay. Do you need some Botox? Do you need some Xanax? Do you need some cosmic Xanax? Yes, please, how many? 62 fucking thousand. Okay, there you go, cosmic Xanax. And I'm feeling like my chest is really tight. Okay, babe. All right, I'm going to go nap now. I'm sorry about their stuff. 
I'll do better. I'll do better. I'll get it. I'll get it. I'll get it. You know, they say I'm young, which is true. So I got time, but I don't know how much time I got because they get pretty upset with me. And you have all the time you require with your, with your people. They're, they're not going anywhere. Okay. You're not going anywhere either. Okay. All right. What's going on with your chest, honey? It's anxiety. Yeah. I get so worried. Cause like, you know, even though we're packed, but like they kick me out of the pack if they don't like what I do. Like I got to fit in with the pack. I know, babe. So anybody, Abby, ask Abby to come help me. Okay, well, Abby, will you spend some time with him and give him your calm? Sure. Okay. All right, guys. Okay, I'm going to go back to the human now. It's recorded, right? Whatever that means. Yes, it is. Okay. All right. Boom. There. He wanted okay. to talk more. Who's Abby? Oh, Abby is a blind and deaf uh, albino cocker spaniel. Okay, so Abby is a blind and deaf Cocker Spaniel who lives where? Lives in Wisconsin. So I've met her in person. <clears throat> um, and she's a healer. So when a dog is having issues anywhere in the world, because I've had a dog in the United Kingdom, in California, you know, I'll ask Abby. Can you go spend some time with them? So she energetically, telepathically, because her telepathic abilities are beyond Wally's because she doesn't hear. She doesn't see. She doesn't have those senses. So she got her telepathic intuitive, these other senses that we, don't, we might not even have words for are heightened. So she'll go spend time with the dog that's upset, with the dog that just had surgery. and she'll, her energy will come and snuggle in with them and hang out with them. Cause like Wally got like, is like somebody hit me in my chest. Cause he got really concerned about being kicked out of the pack. Cause he knows he keeps doing this and he's really struggling not to do it. Um, and like you said, you know, if he were in the wild, like a canine, everything is theirs. There's nothing they're not supposed to really touch. Right. It's so free game yes and you want to chew on a stick you chew on a stick but here something's next to you 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 don't chew on it because it's a pillow it's their crap so he is trying so hard and and learn. he's getting he's getting worried so he's getting anxious that he'll be kicked out not that anybody said anything but like they know they have to get along in the pack and or they can be kicked out of the pack there's there's rules in packs <laughs> Right. That's why. They, so, so he and between you and me, we both know that Wally and Maggie are going nowhere. We love them so much, right? I told him that because I know that. No, I wouldn't have told him that if I didn't know that. If he was on the verge of being rehomed, then we do we put like a shield around, or you know, it'd be something different energetically. Right. But for this, and sometimes they just need to be heard just like the human, they just need to be heard and they need someone to say, I know it's hard. I get it. And you're not going anywhere. And I, and I feel with you, I feel your sadness. I feel your anxiety. You want this cosmic Xanax, which is an energy out there because we've had Xanax for what, 30 yeah. years. Okay. So I know what cosmic Xanax is, but our mm -hmm. listeners don't know what cosmic Xanax is. Mm -hmm. What is cosmic Xanax? Julie? Well, it has the energy of Xanax without the byproducts. So you don't have to take the pills because Xanax has been and um, Transadone, Botox, they've been out there for years. So there, an energy exists of them. And so they are able to request, explain yep. how the cosmic Xanax works for our listeners. Oh, well, it just, it, it works. Like while he asked for it, he asked for, I don't know why they like to ask for 62,000, which when it, first occurred actually an animal was the first one that asked for cosmic xanax i didn't know this energy existed until an animal brought it up and i'm like oh okay i just go with it my logical mind is working in the back the accountant mind is like okay this doesn't make sense what the hell you know but then i'm like you shut up shut up we're just going with this you know <laughs> and so yeah cosmic xanax is the energy of that 
when the when the when the Xanax takes effect in the in the body, and you're like, "Whoo, okay, you're not able to worry as much." Okay, the trazodone, if they're like, ah, ha, ha. it's like, Whew. okay, tranquilizes the Botox, like pause if they have issues with pause or issues with sinuses, they like the cosmic Botox to be shot in there. Um, so the animals. Um, it's the energy of that item without having to take the pharmaceutical and you can't overdose on it because it doesn't have the byproduct. It just has the energy, the beneficial energy of it. So now the question becomes, can only you administer it or can people administer it for their animals randomly? Anybody can. You can be like, hey, do you want cosmic Xan? Because it, it, it exists out there. It's in the, it's in the fifth dimension. Well, it's in the third dimension too, but it's in the fifth dimension. And so you can just say, you know, if you got, you know, cat Chevy, that's one of my cats, Chevy, would you like some cosmic Botox? And a lot of times the owner knows when the animal says yes, because, you know, they know the look on the face. You're like, okay, there you go. It's a, if you believe it, it, if you, you know, if you believe it, it, it works. How many would you like? Okay. Even if you don't hear the animal, you have that pause so the animal speaks because they are speaking to you all the time. When they're staring right at you like that, I'll look right into the camera. They're not saying I love you. They're communicating something and you aren't hearing it. So they look like, do like this even harder. Like, hello, exactly. knock, knock, knock. knock. Gotta go pee, 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 you know? <laughs> and right? And before I, hit, before I hit my head, I thought I had a dog called Muggsy and I thought he was just telling me he loved me, you know, because he was that intense. I'm like, oh, I love you too, honey. <laughs> the poor dogs. They're like, our people are so stupid. We keep telling them and they just keep doing the opposite or whatever. It's like, I'm like, they can't hear you. It's broken. And um, they're like, oh, okay. So. Okay, so so Julie, we also uh, so let's go with this. Okay, so we know Wally is really struggling with the stuff. What stuff is is everyone's? What stuff is his? What stuff is ours? And granted, humans have a lot of crap. Um, with Maggie, we were really concerned about her feeling a sense of attachment and realizing that she is safe and loved and home she said i'm home as long as wally is home so her safety is wally mm. okay which she gets concerned too about wally screwing up Okay. They get concerned about, um, about Peter leaving. And I said, he might leave to go to work, but he'll always come back home. Mm. So they, they read our minds. So even when we're acting like, you know, fake it till you make it huge thing. Right. So we go through transitions. We go, you know, um, yeah. <laughs> so they sense that. We can't hide it from them. And that's and so interesting because Peter is going through a transition right now, right? And um, and so because he is going through that transition, it's interesting that she would pick up on that. Mm -hmm. And then they, the way they interpret it, just like humans, you know, your neighbor can interpret something that's going on in your home by the signs they see of you coming and going or whatever they hear, right? But it might not be correct, you know? <laughs> so like Maggie was thinking, you know, that he might leave the home. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you no, know, he'll always, that would be for a job and he would always come back. So I don't know what he's looking at for work, you know, cause some of us will work, you know, some people would go to Quebec for the week and then they take a train back for the weekends. I mean, we had that in California between, um, you know, people go to San Francisco and work there for the week, but then they'd come back to the country areas for the weekend. I, I don't know what's being looked at, but she senses that 
that she sensed that. So I told her, no, he's always coming back home. Well, and what's interesting about that is that Peter works from home. So while his work, his work from home is more or less at home. And, and, and so from working from home is not him potentially leaving. However, energetically, he's, you know, he's feeling some division and, and difficulty. Mm-hmm. So it's the sense of that. Huh? Yeah. Incredible awareness. So yeah. is it possible, Julie, then to communicate with her again that, that you know, I mean, we, we try so hard to, to express to her how much we love her and how she is home and she is safe and that she's with us. She's at our little girl now. Mm-hmm. You know, is there a way to, to, I mean, we express it, but is there a way for you to communicate that to her and check in with her? Yeah, I said, this is your space now. And she said, I know, but what if it goes away? I said, I get it. What Chico went through, that's what I'm going to get? Yes, honey. Okay, good. Because Chico came and he was like, for lack of a better explanation, like a foster child that had been through like, you know, maybe 15 homes. So when he got to my home, he would hide in closets and yeah, he would show me his, his butt. And he was like, yeah, it's great, but it could go away at any moment. Right. Um, and um, so Chico is now a spirit out there and he's a major spirit. Um, so they have a, the, the animal world has a whole network in the spirit world. Okay. Some of them are still in their bodies and some of them aren't. So she knows the, energetically what Chico went through. So, so I can just reference like Chico and she'd be like, Oh, like what Chico went. Okay. So she knows that energy of coming in and having been in an unstable situation and now having it be stable. So they can draw on, on his experiences and get that energy of being stable. Now Chico had a goal six months, eight months before it finally was like, that's my lady. And I'm her and I'm her guy. And that's nothing's changing, you know, no matter what happens, you know. Um, yeah. I mean, because it didn't happen right away. But with that, just like the cosmic Xanax, an energy exists out there that the animals can draw on. Humans can too, but the animals do it like that because they don't have an analytical mind. <laughs> I was just going to say, because our fucking analytical mind, because this thing Uh up here gets, I'm tapping my forehead for people listening. The third eye. In the third eye gets shut, closed, right? We are like, we, we completely blind ourselves. And like you said, we get, and we talked about this, we get so stuck in the basic senses that we've learned instead of recognizing that there's so much more out there in that energy. Yeah. And Maggie just grabbed that. She grabbed that energy of being secure after you weren't secure. And all she had to say was, oh, like Chico. And I'm like, yes. Okay. She got it. So now it's like, they're not going anywhere. Like you didn't go anywhere. Exactly. They're going to take me to the hotel. Like you did. Exactly. Like I, you know, he had, you know, he had whatever he he required, he went, he went everywhere with me, including hotels, including, and because he would bite, I could leave him in the car. Nobody was going to steal him or the car. So I could leave the windows down. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'd be like, peacefully protect our stuff. And he would, he'd sleep most of the time, but I knew that, you know, I could leave the windows all the way down. Nobody was going to get a hand reached in there to grab, you know, my $5 in the change drawer. It wasn't going to happen. Um, <laughs> but he went, he, he was my guy. And even when I was in the nursing home for two months, I had security cameras. So I still could talk to him. He could hear my voice, but we really got the telepathic thing going then. Cause I paid dog walkers to come in and walk them twice a day. So he was alone for 23 hours. So 
a day. Wow. So that energy exists too. So when we deal with separation anxiety, we really learn from Chico how to do this. How can an animal feel secure and be alone for 23 hours a day? But, he, but we, we figured it out. And one of the things is, is the security cameras. And then I can talk to him and he can telepathically communicate with me, see where I am. And I tell people, commu te communicate telepathically with your animal, even if you don't think you have it. Stare at your dashboard in your car for five seconds and just think of your dog. You're sending, this is where I am. And most dogs have been in our vehicles. This is where I am. They'll pick it up. Even, you know, even if we're not picking up them, they'll pick it up. Um, okay, so that kind of comes back to our dogs seem to know when we're coming home, right? Mm -hmm. So that's something we can all relate to, Julie. Our dogs seem to know when we're coming home. How do they know when we're coming home? <clears throat> they read your mind. <laughs> you heard it, folks. They read your mind. Mm -hmm. They see the pictures. What you're seeing with your eyes, they're seeing. And so then they know that you're coming home and they're ready and they're excited and they're not only need to go pee, but they also want to love you up. Because you've returned to the pack. Yay, it's party time for like what? 30, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, and then they go lay back down. Totally. Yeah, that's, yeah they give you a proper hello because the pack is back together. And, and what I tell my clients is you were out hunting or scavenging because that they understand. And that has a picture of a dog coming back with scavenged goods. Um, they don't understand like, oh, I love you. I'll be back later. Blah, 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 blah. No, no. They understood a picture. Give them a picture. I'm hunting. Okay. And I go to an office to hunt, or I go to a factory to hunt, or I go to a classroom to hunt. It's complicated, or, you know. Right. Or even a vacation. Even, even a vacation. A vacation. Uh -huh. I go on a vacation to hunt so that they understand that concept of I'm coming back. Mm hmm mm hmm And you then know, you. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. And then you, you know, you check in when you're on vacation or you're at work, you just, you check in, you're like, Hey, Hey, Maggie, Hey, Wally, this is where I am. And you, you hold your gaze on something. Like I'd hold my gaze on the curtain or something and be like, Oh, okay. All right. Got it. Cause they like humans forget what they've been told. Cause they have their routine. Boom, 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 boom. Their habits. Right. right? And um, so the dog that I'm dog sitting now, I said, okay, she's taking her friend to the doctor in, in another city. And it's like, oh yeah, I forgot. Cause he was going room to room looking for his person. You know, and I'm like, oh, remember she's in the Prius? Oh yeah, without me? Yeah, remember Auntie Donna is, is with her? Oh, Auntie Donna don't know shit. <laughs> The, my lady is my job, you know, for this particular dog. And, and I'm like, well, Auntie Donna is going to do the job for the next two darknesses. And it's like, oh, Auntie Donna don't know shit. She can't do that job. Now, um, I, okay. I have to interrupt this job concept because you actually have checked in with our dogs to see what their jobs are. Will you please share with me what Wally's job is? Oh, yeah, that I remember. Wally's job is to spread the word. I'm Wally. It's, it's the only dog I've met that that's his job to spread the word. I don't know what the word is, but he's spreading it. Wally's job is to spread the word. Now, what's Maggie's job? Oh, she just said, love everybody. Maggie, what's your job? Love everybody and watch Wally because he's a handful. <laughs> and she's showing me a picture of Peter. So mm. it, it Peter is a big part of her job. Mm. Yeah. Because a lot of times they are assigned to a human. The world, the energy world, spirit world, animal world, whatever it is, assigns them, gives them assignments. And they can have more than one in a lifetime. So Peter is Maggie's assignment to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. Is Wally and my assignment? Is am I Wally's assignment? Wally, do you have an assignment? Yes. Spread the word. 
<laughs> it's like, and so then I was able to ask, what well, does Wally run away? And and, oh. Pe and Peter was like, yes, sometimes. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. He loves to go and explore and spread the word, make new friends, and not come back. <laughs> so, you know, and in those cases, I tell clients, you thank the animal for doing their job. So we know it's Wally's job to spread the word. So when he runs away and doesn't want to come back and you go and you walk to the neighbor's house or whatever, or the next suburb <laughs> and yep. you get you get Wally, you're like, Wally, thank you for doing your job. I see you spread the word. Thank you so much. Let's go home now. And then they're like, okay, because, you know, you try to punish them or yell at them like, don't do that no more. It's like they're doing their job. Right. And sometimes I'm able to give them a different job that doesn't can't coexist with the one that's bothersome. <laughs> but that hasn't been the case with Wally. <laughs> oh, yes, my sweet Wally. He is a handful, let me tell you, but just so much fucking joy. That is the thing. Like I did a, I did a podcast episode about um, pandemic pets. I don't know if you've listened to it, Julie, but you know, this is kind of the follow-up to that because our pets are a really huge part of our lives. And, you know, I know people who have really felt that their, their pets have saved their lives or reciprocally that they saved their pets' lives, but in reality, their pets saved their life. Um, we have incredible relationships with our pets. We talk to them, we marvel with them, we see the world through their eyes, um, and we love them because when they're part of a pack, they do become a family member. And because they're a family member, we want them to live their best life possible. And that means not having those frustrations as much and understanding them better and having a great relationship with them. And so what I, what I love so, so much about you, Julie, is that as an animal communicator, you open a door for your clients to have insight into their animals and be able to make that reciprocal relationship richer. If people want to get a hold of you or learn more about you, I will make sure that I have all of the contact information in the show notes. But I want them to know about your YouTube channel. Tell us about that. Oh, yes. It's Animal Messages with Julie. Plain and simple. Um, it's weekly. Um, so I use Zoom to record it so i'll have guests um and it's my week in review so as what i've learned who what animal has told me what our week in review and sometimes people will come on because it's a way to get free services you can come right. on and ask about your animal um and i'll send you the the zoom link to come on on it's thursdays it would be 6 p.m. in Alberta, 7 p.m. Central Time, 8 p.m. New York Time, and yeah, 5 p.m. California Time, Vancouver Time on Thursdays. Mm -hmm. And I try to keep it to like five minutes because I want it gets put up on YouTube later, like two days later, goes on YouTube. Um, but less, sometimes we've even gone to an hour because we had a guest on that was clearing cats emotions and the cats absorb emotions from the humans. So it was clearing, 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 clearing. So we had a number of people come on and, and, um, get pro bono services that way. So that one was an hour long, but, wow. um, I don't know how many they're up there. Cause I, I just do it every week. I don't know what's going to happen. Sometimes there's a plan, but especially with animals plans don't go as <laughs> planned plans as don't go as planned, planned. My friend. they're like they're in the moment so whatever Absolutely. that moment is um and uh yeah 
That's so, amazing. I will make sure that your contact information is in the in our show notes because I know that there are going to be lots of people who listen who are like, I need to talk to this lady because as wacky as this sounds, it's intriguing. I'm curious. And I hope that people who know me understand that like in a million years, did I think that I would be like, my friend Julie is going to be communicating with my animals. Um, <laughs> you know, like not a fucking chance. There's the truth, Julie, not a fucking chance. And yet the magic that comes from the work that you do for your clients and for their animals, it could be dismissed. I keep coming back to, and I just want to I, we're going a little long here, but I just, I keep coming back to, what's his name? Edgar. Edgar. Yes. Edgar had a pretty rough life and he was in a foster home and his foster parent was very, very concerned for him because she didn't know if he would ever be able to be rehomed because of his trauma. And so his temporary foster human at that time had you work with him what happened to edgar 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 is part was he a mastiff he's part he's mastiff so he's strong and bigger okay and he had been hit with a brick on his head he had a scar on his head so i asked um you know, what, what I asked the animals, what question and he said, Oh, a brick fell on my head. So did it fall or was it in a human's hand? It was in a human's hand. It was one of those dogs that was like, would show you his butt. He wouldn't come out from under the desk. He would chew on cords. At one point he was chewing on the, the router cord when his foster mom was um, doing a presentation on zoom. Or one of the platforms. Yeah. And he's oh my God. <laughs> right. So he, um, yeah, we, we cleared, we talked about it. We cleared the trauma. Because once I get the what happened in the images, I can cut the cord to bricks. I can cut the cord to various things. So it doesn't have that reactive um, a smell. Like a smell of a certain cologne can do it if they were abused by someone wearing a certain cologne. Um, you know, just the side up here, if they had been beaten, like whatever it is, mm -hmm. um, can, can trigger them. So we just, we clear that and they don't have a judgment about it. They're not like, how does this work? We just, we run the processes, which I studied for that first year when I had my eyes closed and I was listening to all these audio books and taking right. audio courses um, um uh yeah and he is now adopted and within uh new hampshire and helping out a very shy 13 year old boy who was very shy himself but <clears throat> yeah yeah that that's how that's how it it can work and then um being a mastiff he liked to chew so he had appropriate things to chew what it came. I am happy. I am lovable. I am secure. So his foster mom actually on an index card and put it in his kennel. Just the energy of it. I mean, not, yeah. not that Edgar could read it, yep. but it, it came up the recording. And um, when I do these things, the human doesn't have to be present. You turn on the Zoom, it's me. The animal stays usually stays in the room with me. I record it and then I email it to the person. So you walk away for an hour and then you come back. <laughs> you know, it's like so easy peasy for, for the humans. There's not, you don't have to get the car and take it to a trainer, you know, 16 weeks in a row, twice a week. No, it's, yeah. My friends you need to get in touch with my beautiful friend julie oh my god julie this has been i am so grateful that we've been able to share this i love how you communicate with them and have such a deep appreciation this 
tragically beautiful gift. 